Hello, everyone. Welcome to the podcast for the Cube, Cube Pod 39. I'm John Furrier, Dave Vellante. We're here on a two week break. We had Thanksgiving and then we were at reInvent. We were just too burnt out to do a podcast. Um, but uh, we had uh, 41 interviews on site in, in Las Vegas for, as part of AWS reInvent, and as well as um, over two, three dozen interviews in Palo Alto as part of our SuperCloud 5 Battle for AI Supremacy. SuperCloud 5's two year anniversary. Still a thing, Dave. Great to see you. Yeah, great to see you, John. Absolutely. <laughs> Despite see, what the naysayers say. Yeah, we, we love uh, Charles Fitzgerald, lo loving <laughs> keeping the flame alive. Look, a big week. I mean, we just had, in our last podcast, I was in Seattle right off to Adam Slesky. I think when we did that podcast, um, that was the day that, um, you know, Sam Altman drama went down. So much has happened since then. This past week, you know, we're coming off reInvent, which is a monster show, sets the agenda for the industry. Um, and again, the retransformation of all AWS stuff. Great success for the Cube and the Cube Research, formerly Wikibon. Congratulations, Dave! You got personally called out by the CEOs of both companies uh, for your reporting and tracking your research. So, congratulations on that. Um, Thank you. Great, great uh, work on the Cube Research, building that team out. It's going to be really going to pay dividends uh, as as uh, the content continues to be great. The things that are going on, we're going to review in this podcast is we're going to review what happened at reInvent. Focus on the silicon chips. The war continues to see the battle. NVIDIA on stage at reInvent. ARM just had a big event. Intel has an event coming out. And then the, the theme of data flipping the script. This is going to be the topic of our new next SuperCloud 6 event coming either end of January or beginning of February. We're going to do data plus AI, where the data focus is flipping the script. This is a really nuanced point that came out of reInvent. It's kind of part of the AMD announcement. You're starting to squint through all the chip makers and all the hardware people. It's going to come down to who can handle the data better, whether it's a CPU, GPU, NPU, what do you want to call it, TPUs. This is now a new architecture that's being built in the industry. And we're on top of it from day one. So you're going to hear about data flipping the script. And I want to get your take on the breaking analysis, Dave. You've got two major themes that are continuing to roll through and have an impact on the agenda in the industry and, frankly, changing how industry analysts are covering the industry. I want to get into that data, the sixth platform, I think as you think you call it, the sixth platform. Sixth, sixth data platform, yeah. The sixth data platform. Google announces Gemini that debuts um, integrating Gemini's models into applications with Google AI Studio and Google Cloud Vertex available December 13th. Huge announcement, huge game changer, multimodal, and a Cube alumni is working on that project. Eli Collins, formerly of Cloudera. I just pinged him on LinkedIn. Mm. We've been going back and forth, so he's going to come on the cube. And obviously, AMD had a big event. We're going to dig into that because there was a lot of announcements that we were kind of covering in the data center side, Dave, from the ARM side, as well as Intel. I know you have an opinion. I got some inside reporting from AMD directly uh, from people close to the, to, the, to the company and close to the situation that hasn't been reported yet. Intel's got an event coming up. I ping them. Uh, apparently, it's going to be on the New York Stock Exchange with Pat Gelsinger, and they're doing a remote interview there. And then... Microsoft's $13 billion open AI investment is under FTC scrutiny, Dave. So again, oh, there's a shock. <laughs> okay. So lean is at it again. <laughs> there's other stuff too. So again, but this is important because what happened with the Altman situation two weeks ago, again, since our last pod, the, the drama has been off the charts. Uh, so we're going to dig into that. This quasi rant and material because at reInvent, remember, this whole idea of model choice, Google and Amazon are saying model choice, Microsoft not so much. Um, and we're going to talk about the Broadcom VMware situation. Um, I posted a, a picture of the sign that says Broadcom, not a VMware company. Their headquarters is moving to Palo Alto. We have reported that. Now it's now confirmed. They're divesting their end user computing and carbon black business as we had predicted. And again, it's the two-year anniversary of SuperCloud Day. <laughs> it's still a thing, uh, uh, subject to uh, the debate in the industry with Charles Fitzgerald, <laughs> who, who, you know, I think he's recognizing it now that it is a thing, but he's going to die on that hill. So we'll we're, we'll have fun with it, and it's going to be a great time. So let's kick it off. Uh, SuperCloud, Dave, it's a thing. Uh, SuperCloud 6 coming up. We're yeah, going to continue I mean to do that. We've had five super clouds now, and we're bringing, it's not just our thing, we bring in the community and we're getting, you know, all these really deep technical experts to talk about it, you know, whether you call it multi-cloud management or cross-cloud or uh, Dave Link Link Linthicum calls it meta-cloud, you know, there's definitely a super cloud trend and it's, it's gaining traction. 
Uh, we've seen guys like Cloudflare, uh, Matthew Prince. Yeah, they actually use the term super cloud, sky computing. I mean, it's it's basically everywhere. Uh, and so, yeah, it's, Fitzy just you know loves to hammer that. But I mean, even Microsoft is doing what I would consider super clouds. So, which is his, you know, Microsoft his is his camp. So, yeah. love well, it. We, um, we had we had the battle. We had the uh, super cloud five event, which we had coined because it was a studio event for Palo Alto that we ran in conjunction with our on location in reInvent our forty one interviews on site. Those editorial interviews, um, and. The theme was battle for AI supremacy. Well, Dave, there's many battles going on. There's battles at the chip level and battles at the middle of the stack level and the models and how that's going to interact. So, I mean, <laughs> this, this battle is at the board level too. <laughs> board level. I mean, so many battles. It's, it, because the stakes are high. The AI game is so powerful that the stakes are high and everyone's realizing what to do. And what what they're trying to figure out is, which side of the street do we need to be on to be on the right side of history? And that's what's going to happen right now. And you're going to see um, all the companies and developers and architects really thinking through, how do I deploy my resources to maximize the benefits of AI today and going in the, into tomorrow without foreclosing the headroom opportunities that are going to emerge? And that's going to come around the co combination of which hardware you buy, which chips you use, and how you manage your data. That, to me, is the big takeaway from reInvent. The flywheel that Swami and I were talking about on our interview was notable. And that was kind of original content where he actually were riffing in real time. There's a data flywheel happening, Dave. And it doesn't look like yesterday's flywheel. And this is really interesting. And so the silicon chips, the relationships between chips, uh, hardware, what's around the chips, GPUs, CPUs, NPUs, you know, the neural processing unit is becoming quite the offload accelerator option in the architecture and the chips and the interconnect around it are going to be the thing. We saw that at reInvent when in videos on stage, when Jensen was on stage with Adam Selesky, they were specific in their architecture. The gains that they're getting by cobbling together the GPUs is significant. So I think we had that right at supercomputing. We were talking about that, but this is going to be the battle. What does the cluster well, look like? How is it architected? And does it support the ability to span out clusters to support the new data model, the six data platform as you're reporting? Right. And, and AMD made a big push this week. They announced that they're shipping their latest AI chip. They they said it's comparable in, in performance to the H100. Of course, it doesn't have the software richness of the CUDA architecture. But one of the stats that Lisa Sue threw out was the market. I don't know whose stat this was said maybe it's their stat 400 billion dollars by 2027 and i was like wow okay so nvidia trailing 12 month revenue is probably like 45 billion amd's probably 20 low 20s so if that's the case that the market's actually that big well what's the tam tam's got to be at least half a billion well, she's she's saying 400 billion by 2027 for ai chips yeah, okay the so market get, for ai chips they get 10 percent of that that's massive numbers yeah, I think you know that's exactly my little stake in the ground, John. If they're if they're let's say twenty twenty two billion today, trailing twelve months, can they be? Can they double by twenty twenty seven? AMD, no question in my mind. The bigger, more interesting question to me is what happens to Nvidia, because I think they're going to have two thirds of the market. I mean, they could be two hundred, two hundred fifty billion if that's the case. You know, well, Intel is going to get its piece. Yeah. AMD is going to get it. The cloud guys are going to get their piece. But NVIDIA could have, you know, half that market, half that that 400 billion. Well, I tell you, uh, AMD was the first ones to really come out with an AI engine dedicated chip. The Phoenix chip came out earlier in the year that had NPUs, I believe. Um, and this new announcement is with the new um, the the new MI 300 is interesting. And and the Ryzen chip, um, the Ryzen chip as well. Um, has that software stack capability now, mostly for Windows workloads. But the question, Dave, is the question that I have, and I couldn't make the event. I wasn't feeling well coming back from reInvent, but I did watch it online. Can the software stack, AMD software stack, which is called ROCM, really handle the primetime LLM stuff? Or is it just going to be dedicated to, say, um, you know, Windows workloads or Microsoft Office? Um, not that that's a bad low-hanging fruit option. I just... Is the market moving too fast? And this is going to be the question that we're going to watch and squint through. I think, I think there's so much demand for these types of systems that even if, 
I mean, I have I, when I've talked to some like deep AI experts, I, I won't share who, who, who one person like told me this. He said, look, even Intel's chips, which, you know, are relative to NVIDIA, or, you know, far less capable. We use them because we can get work done with them. It's just it's taking longer and it's, you know, yeah. it's made, it's more expensive overall relative to NVIDIA. You know, Jensen, you know, pay, spend more, you'll save more kind of thing. Uh, but so there's so much <laughs> demand that I think Intel can do well. I think yeah. AMD can do well. Obviously, NVIDIA is going to do well. You also have Google, AWS, Microsoft, Meta, all building AI chips because the demand is just enormous. Yeah. So th if, you, if you think about the, the developer angle, though, Dave, what's interesting is all the success that NVIDIA is having, a lot of it is all positioning well with CUDA, right? So uh, CUDA is out there yep. getting that abstraction layer to really build around and get the maximum out of the chips themselves. Now you got the CPU, GPU, and NPU, the NPU being the neural processing unit, is, you know, TPUs are out there. That's their version. AM, they, other people call it APUs, whatever you want to call it. doesn't matter. It's now the the holy trinity of the chip design. You got to architect that offload, and so you know this is a field day for the OEMs. You look at uh, who was on stage at the AMD event. You had um, Dell, uh, Meta, Microsoft, Oracle's of the world, um, even Lenovo. I mean, Lenovo was on there. Supermicro, you know, all these people are, are dedicated to buying chips. Okay, so the question is, everybody wins in this rising tide. So even Intel, so, and, and to me, my walk away from this was Intel and AMD are, are totally head-to-head. -to -head. Major win for AMD uh, as AMD and Intel go head-to-head -head, uh, and the whole, whole data center theme. You know, they didn't talk much about um, what we were reporting in, uh, uh, prior to reInvent and during reInvent about NVIDIA's G uh, DGX cloud. Yeah, okay, but so, so, so but here's the problem for Intel. I mean, yes, Intel can do well you know, everybody's rising tide. The problem for Intel is Intel for so many years, decades had a monopoly. Whereas where AMD was, you know, taking, like we like to say, croissants off the breakfast table. Um, and so AMD has got upside opportunity, whereas Intel is basically, it's it's not even slowly, it's, it's grip on its historical Wintel monopoly is just, it's loosening quite dramatically as it fights this multi-front war with foundry um I, that's one of be one of my topics i think uh yeah next week on breaking analysis is can intel you know make it in foundry and i got ben uh uh from str uh, strategic or from creative strategies coming on he's a real expert on this but but so the problem is that intel is 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 amd nvidia you know they're rising the cloud guys are rising intel's hanging on for dear life and it's going from whatever mid sixty percent gross margins down to, you know, run of the mill. Now, who knows? Maybe they can bounce off that that bottom. But that's the problem that I see for Intel is that n bye bye monopoly. Yeah, and in, and Intel was coming shooting a, a bullet across the bow of AMD, saying we weren't that impressed. We had that story up in Silicon Angle as well. Um, Dell debuted new power scale storage systems. IBM unveiled next gen. Um, the quantum processor, um, a lot of stuff. You know, Gecko Robotics raised 100 million for critical infrastructure, AI powered robots. And, um, and Dell, you know, you take a company like Dell, Lenovo, HPE, I mean, they're basically buying chips they have for years. They, they're they used to, you know, paying up for whether it was Intel and now NVIDIA. So for them, if to the extent that they can have higher ASPs, that's, that's goodness. I mean, Dell knows how to thrive in a low margin world. Um, as do you know many of those other companies, so they benefit in my my mind from the AI tailwind. Um, and it is even Intel, you know, can do well here. And it may be the, you know, between the U.S. government, the the Chips Act, the de the massive demand for for semiconductors that doesn't seem to be waning, you know, could could save Intel's butt. I hope it does because we need Intel. Well, let's, the chips are happening, the chips wars, and we're seeing Amazon continue to have good results from the reInvent vibe. Uh, outside of the snarky comments from the Fitzies of the world who were kind of down on Amazon, I thought um, they did a great event. The whole or write-up around Q being hallucinating, I think platformer Casey Newton, he's not a real strong enterprise writer. I think he was just jumping on the bandwagon. His sources weren't that strong. Ah, this... But come on, it's, uh, he, they got a hold of some internal document. Yeah, they would tell I mean, QA. They would... Just, hey, hey, we got an issue. We got to fix it. What, like, yeah. like what? Q's going to be, first of all, Q, 
the the fact that AWS was able to get a legitimate demo out by reInvent was, yeah. I think, pretty astounding. Now, to me, it was a demo because my sources indicate that Q was really trained on Titan, which is not, you know, an advanced uh, a, a foundation model like OpenAI, you know, like Google's models, like Anthropic. Okay, that's fine. They are going to port Q over to Anthropic. They're, I'm sure, well at hand doing that already. Anthropic and other LLMs inside of, of Bedrock. So the fact that they were able to get that demo and actually, the demo was actually really good, but it is it is a demo. Um, and so, of course, there's going to be problems. And you get well, internal documents. I mean, I'm that that doesn't concern me. You know, the, the, the bigger issue is, when will we actually see something like yeah. that go into production and become a platform that developers can use to build intelligent apps? Yeah. <laughs> well, you cut my rant off, but that, I appreciate that comment. But yeah, exactly. It was a, a, the mis, misread on that story was it was an internal, they're testing it. That's what you do. You test for bugs. Um, <laughs> it's a big story. Oh my God, I got a huge have scoop. You, have I mean, you ever seen the... software with no bugs? I mean, it, that was stupid. Yeah, that, I, I that, thought that, that, when you yeah. read, when you actually read the story, it's like a bullshit headline. And then you read the story, you go, oh, okay. Yeah. They got an internal document. They have bugs in it and they're fixing them. Okay. That was a waste. Of they're racing for scoops. You know, on one hand, you got, you know, the press racing for scoops. On the other hand, you got people waving their hands, looking for attention. Uh, we're the next big thing. You know, that kind of thing's going on. Look, at, at the end of the day, the world is going to go through us um, quickly with AI. The the flight to quality is going to be there. We're going to see, you know, the good stuff go on. But but anyway, back to Amazon. I counted forty. I counted like forty four generative AI announcements at reInvent. Now, half of them were, were were in preview or were announcing the general availability of. But still, there were like twenty legit, you know, new AI announcements, Gen AI announcements at reInvent. That's that's I, I I don't see how that's a miss. I mean, this, we've been to so many shows this year where it's just like, yeah. you know, AI washing. I we we, I, we compiled our research team just compiled Dave and you know because you and I are working on this with them, the um the recent all the announcements they had a zillion announcements by category I think over two hundred. I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it was it's pretty astounding. astounding. I tweeted about it. I was like blown away by just. I mean, it's always like that, but still. Um, well, let's so get, I. I Go ahead. I, well, I, I, I wanted to just segue from the chips because the next bullet item yeah. was the flipping of the script. Because one of the things we've been re reporting up into reInvent, I mean, you wrote a post with George about the whole Uberization of enterprise. That thing still was resonating with and getting tons of traffic. I think that's a seminal piece. We're going to look back at that this year as one of the, the stakes in the ground that, that changed it. But we were going in and challenging the Amazon executives around the notion that if you believe this Gen AI stack is here, and we do, What's that going to do for the data management script? And we mm. were saying it's going to flip the script. Well, guess what? It's flipping the data. This is a big deal. You're and, right. And, and, and there's some data to point to this. So just recently, Vast Data, which we launched launched that company on the Cube, they did an event with us um, with on our studio. They launched inside Palo Alto, and we actually ran their launch event for them. They just got financing at a nine point one billion dollar valuation. They only raised one hundred eighteen million because they're going to do a billion in revenue, Dave. So do the math on the cap table. It's like they gave they, for one hundred eighteen million. They gave up one point three percent of the company. It's like the cap table barely didn't did change. They it, they went three x increase step up. Okay, in a matter of months. And so I they think, only did it to get fidelity. I think on the cap, they didn't need the money. I mean, what's 118? They've only raised like $380 million. And they got like 700 people working for them. Well, they, that's, gonna, that's they're, insane. They're, they're bookings at supercomputing. They ever, they had hundreds of meetings. They probably blew it out at, at reInvent. They're, it's resonating with customers, their their approach. And so that's, again, a data point that points to this new sixth platform, right? But, so, so this is, to me, again, the right side of history. You're starting to see the signs. And the markers are laying down right now what success looks like in the new era. So okay? and you'll this appreciate gonna, this. There's going to be a you'll lot of losers this. on the other side. But you'll appreciate this work that we do. So you think about the modern data platform, which I, I think Snowflake is the poster child of the modern data platform. Uh, basically, you know, they were the first, at least to popularize, the separation of compute and storage. Tons of VC money poured into that. But if you think about the cloud databases, and the, the the five you know modern databases database platforms, you're talking about Snowflake, Databricks, and the big three cloud guys: AWS, 
Google BigQuery, mm -hmm. and you can put Microsoft in there. You know, you could argue they're not, but it's Microsoft. So let's put them in there. So all of those were built on a shared nothing architecture because it allowed you to separate compute for storage. And a shared nothing architecture, as you know, each node in the system works independently. You don't share memory or storage with the other nodes. So that what is that? Why is that important? It gives you flexibility at scale, infinite scale. I, I can throw as much compute at it as I want. I've separated the compute from storage. I don't have to buy it in clusters like an exadata. Uh, again, Oracle has you know evolved its platform, but originally it was not. It was it was a, a shared everything, not a shared nothing. So you get the scale flexibility of a of a of a shared nothing. But if you want to get coherence and consistent performance across the nodes, it's very very challenging. The point is the modern data stack was built on shared nothing. And to your point, the new data stack is going to be built on shared everything. So scale up, John, is back, is the point that I want to make here. And the reason is, and this is get kind of esoteric, but we're 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 moving to a world where we're trans to your Uber point. We're turning, we're we're trying to turn strings that database language understands ascii code objects files tables into things that represent real world businesses like uber people places and things riders drivers etas transactions it's all this unstructured and structured data coming together in a co coherent way semantic yeah. that can be operated on in real time that necessitates a completely new data architecture and 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 data center architecture so it's going to be a whole new world in my opinion yeah and, and i think that's the interesting dynamic is that the vast data points to that is also the trend we saw developing early on is the disaggregation of say memory pools for on on-premise action so this idea of disaggregation is happening and if scale up's coming back i guess the question dave is since wikibon research now called the cube research essentially pioneered the concept and research around hyperconvergence. Okay, are we going? Are we live? Is that are we going back to hyperconversion? We we undoing that because if you look at the disaggregation trend, they're they're decoupling systems from each other for more efficiency. So, um, in the cloud, you might want to say I want everything together in the cloud, but for latency reasons, high tail latency. But for like distributed computing, decoupling actually gets you more scale, especially as as you have this kind of chip model what's around the chip, building these high intense clusters, like say GPU clusters. It's easier to stack up a bunch of memory pooling, for instance, and then just have everything underneath it, like object, so, object store or S3. So so are we moving away from hyperconvergence, HCI? The, so it, it, over time, <laughs> we are moving toward, the, so the problem is going to be at exabyte scale. To get consistent writes at exabyte scale, it's really hard, right? And so, so to your point, uh, we're going to see a new architecture emerge that can accommodate exabyte scale. If for you to do exabyte scale at scale out, you can do it, but to get coherence and to to do writes and make sure everything's updated, it's really really slow. Right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's that's the problem. And then. So today you have all this metadata. So the the interesting thing is what's AWS going to do? I really push them at reInvent. Like, how are you going to unify your metadata? How are you going to create a, a, a unified storage platform? And I don't mean S3. I mean, I mean access to structured and unstructured, semi-structured, complex data with all the metadata, the operational metadata, the technical metadata, the business metadata, all in one place so that co-pilots or Q can actually operate with co with confidence that it's coherent and then take action without having a human involved. That's going to require, like today, you know, I, 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 don't quote me on this, but but basically, as an example, technical data, metadata might be in glue. The business mm -hmm. metadata might be in data zone. And so it's in different places. They have to unify that. And the challenge has yeah. been, and uh, Werner Vogels talked about this, he goes, it's your fault. You guys wanted all these different services you wanted primitive access you wanted granularity <laughs> we gave it to you yeah but you i know. think what's going to be for, really you for it now you got what's it gonna, what's going to be really interesting john i'd love your thought on this is how aws deals with that because they've always stepped up to the customer challenge customer obsessed 
And yeah. so you know they're thinking about that. I think data zone yeah. is going to be the way they do this. But 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 it's going to be really interesting to see how that comes together, how long it takes, and how they can because two pizza teams are great at getting a function out fast, but they're not designed to actually make software, you know, composable, if that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, my take on it is a couple of things. One is the um the idea of flipping the script is interesting because now Amazon has all this complexity, right? So, you know, in the old school enterprise days, remember Dave, enterprise software back in the Oracle days and when everyone, you know, was the old enterprise, the you solved complexity with adding more complexity. Right. Yep. You get the lock in. In this market of AI, and we've said this on the cube, and we've been it's been validated by pretty much all the leaders that are innovating. In these inflection points, like the web, the the the, the success formula is pretty well known. Reduce the steps it takes to do a task, make it simpler and easier to understand, intuitive. Those are the forms of success. You can't just bolt on more complexity. So you asked about Amazon. My thinking is, Amazon will change the user experience. They have to reduce the complexity around their cloud from a developer standpoint um from a provisioning standpoint from a hardware standpoint i mean i think they have to get almost into the magical phase of it's magic cloud right it's a magic cloud you know and they have to be magical if they are they got to leverage their ai so that it's so damn easy that they become like the hardened top for performance all the so stuff works the chips are fast developers get action fast ai is working it's reliable it's secure it's fast it supports multiple topologies global infrastructure again they talk about regions i mean just the issues around region is a huge huge issue around data so again back into that's just amazon now oh, it's so complicated wait, before, you, before you get off of amazon let me ask you a question and this is my sort of mental model here so amazon made developers really productive because it took away all the heavy lifting on you know provisioning and managing infrastructure mm -hmm. The market is shifting to your point, the flip to actually now it's developer productivity in terms of writing code, you know, for intelligent apps. And that seems to be that's what's going to drive the next decade of productivity. And so Amazon is really good at, at infrastructure and making that simpler. It's challenge to me is it's got to be get really good on helping, you know, developers write code. I know it's got yeah. code whisper, et cetera, but the but but Amazon's software yeah. is generally designed to make hardware run better. Um, and so the next yeah. wave is to be able to compose different software components so that businesses can run better. So yeah. that's going to be the interesting challenge, I think. Well, well, it's, 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 I, I agree with you, but it's all, all even making it more complicated. Back in the cloud 1.0 days, the early days when Amazon was the, the came out of nowhere and became the leader, we all know the history. We documented on the cube, Andy Jassy, CEO, et cetera, et cetera. They, 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 at, that, at that time, the developer market was full stack developer, okay? Full stack developer means from, from the bottom of the stack to the top of the stack, they had to code everything, okay? When Amazon came out, they just actually provide the hardware. The developer still had to do the rest of the stack, the middle of the layer, the middle layer, and then the app layer. Now we have things with LLMs and data where it's kind of changing significantly at the middleware layer, where those developers have to rely on cloud services for the middleware and can't control their own destiny. Okay, this is where the power dynamics are shifting with data because data at scale gives the developer the advantage. So I think the cloud players will absolutely win on the data layer. They have to because they got the horsepower to back it up unless there's a massive trend for the the enterprise to stand up these quote clusters um and that's where nvidia is going in with their dgx cloud and you know core weaver just got seven billion dollars of funding i think the announcement was or valuation this week and this points to it dave naveen rao the the, the guy who sold this company to databricks okay ai cube alumni he wrote a tweet <laughs> Once, tr once true, continuous reinforcement learning is solved for large-scale neural nets. We'll need quote LLM psychologists to help diagnose why systems have gone depressive and aren't learning effectively. Again, he's making a joke, but he's talking about something around the LLM dynamic, prompt injections. So this whole LLM foundation model thing is the new middle layer. This is where the cloud players will either win or die on the hill because the developers need that layer right so again back to developers it's not a full stack 
loading a building a SaaS app on the old cloud was easy. Get some stuff on the server, EC2, S3, queuing, basic building blocks. Yeah, they add more services. I grow, CapEx not needed, win. Now the developers still have to rely on the clouds for the hardware and the middle layer. That's complicated. So Amazon has to, and Azure and Google, they have to make it easier. They have to make it easier for the developer so that they can get the job done and not make it complex and, and problematic. Azure and Google have been getting killed on, quote, support calls. I've been seeing all over Twitter. I've been waiting four days for a resolve. It's going to yeah. be interesting, Dave. I mean, uh, the uh, cloud guys got to ramp up and make this shit simpler for developers because developers are the gold standards. They're the ones who set the standards. That that's the next battle. But by the way, just as a quick aside, you mentioned Core Weave. Mm -hmm. I saw a stat. It was might have been in the journal around Vast's announcement. Nine, you said nine point one billion, right? Mm -hmm. So there were only like four, maybe it was five, but I I can think of four companies that had, you know, an uptick in valuation over the last I don't mm -hmm. know, maybe it was twelve months. It was Core Weave, and it was Fidelity, Vast. It was open AI, of course, and Anthropic. And I think that was it. Every yeah. all the other data platforms yeah. were like, uh, you know, had a down, down, you know, marked down valuation. And Fidelity led both Core Weave and Vast. Again, so well, is Fidelity the bellwether? We'll see. But I mean, there's still cash going out in a market that's down on the later stage financing. I mean, you still we saw we're reporting on the cube today. Um, things like MongoDB, Elastic Vector Search, um, general availability coming out soon. Extropic raises 14 million to build physics based computing hardware for generative AI. Assembly AI raised 50 million for cloud based speech models. Nexus Flow outperforms GPT software tools. Arthur Chat. Um, launches to leverage proprietary data for the AI. Liquid AI raised $37 million to build liquid neural networks. Meta debuts new generative AI features for consumers. Purple Llama, safe generative AI. Mm -hmm. The list goes on and on. Dave, it's still funding this AI wave. You can see the dots connecting, okay? This high entrepreneurial activity going on. Uh, Meta is a big player. You're seeing the success of Meta. I mean, talk, about, miss, talk about missing a trend. Metaverse? They, it's an AI company now. So um, the, you're going to see Meta get in the game big time. And I said this in the queue. You remember, we said this last year. Meta's open source strategy was genius. Feed the developers. Okay. Open source is going to be where the battleground will win for the companies that nurture and get these developers innovating and competing with the big models. Okay. And, and I said it again. I'll say it after reInvent too, because they even get it. As the price performance of the hardware comes down and the models can be run on, on hardware that's coming out, the chips, as we say, the opportunities for startups to innovate will be very big, just like the web. So I'm I'm anticipating a surge of startups and funding. And the AMD thing helps developers too. Now, that could help developers certainly within the Microsoft area, for sure, out of the gate with the Ryzen 80, 8040 CPUs uh, and the M1300X chip. Um, but, you know, AI software stacks are coming and, and that's going to be, to me, an area to watch. We're, we're going to watch that very closely. Well, you, you know, Thomas Friedman wrote the book, The World is Flat. And he made a lot of money and he became very famous. Every time he was, ta you know, he talked, he talked about Moore's Law, Moore's Law, Moore's Law. And he would, you know, draw that comparison with how innovation, you know, occurred. You ain't seen nothing yet. I mean, the amount of data, the amount of processing power, the amount of, you know, GPU capabilities is going to blow away. The the, the curve is bending. Um, and, and so the innovations that we're going to see come out of this uh, are just going to be like nothing we've ever seen before, in my opinion. So what do you think about Naveen Rao's tweet that, you know, once continuous reinforcement learning is solved for large scale neural networks, Will there be a need for LLM psychologists to help diagnose why systems have gone depressive and aren't learning effectively? Again, this is, again, a new role. Ah, I didn't see that. That's okay. good. Uh, he, That's tweeted, good. He, he tweeted it out on December 3rd. Um, but he brings up a good point. These new roles that are emerging, right? If you talk about data, how do you handle governance, all the classic data management stuff? If you're scaling data at large scale, if you don't build it in from day one, 
then you're going to constantly be chasing inefficiencies. So the question is, what do you optimize for from a data standpoint? So this is why I'm I'm very bullish on this data flipping the script because it's happening. Well, everyone, so everyone we talk to is saying the same thing. So the other thing too is the, the when when flash storage came about, so the, the the spinning disk was always the bottleneck, right? In system architecture, when flash storage came about, and you started to get you know things like NVMe and atomic writes, all of a sudden the network became the bottleneck, and what you're seeing now whether it's, you know, uh, InfiniBand or Ethernet, and Ethernet's exceedingly capable, and, and you're seeing software written on top to really take advantage of, you know, higher network speeds. And so now you can do this sort of any to any. So this is why I was saying before about shared nothing becomes shared everything. And any node on the network can, 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 can access any, any storage, any compute can get to any data over this like really, really fast network. That changes the game, and and that's where at, at exabyte scale, it's going to be interesting. This shared nothing that we've you know grown to love and really become used to with the cloud, um, I think is going to be challenged, and it's going to be really interesting to see how all this infrastructure that we have out there is going to evolve. Well, I think I think the. Uh architectures change again this is why we've been saying this going into reinvent the super cloud two-year anniversary kind of speaks to what we saw and remember last year at reinvent prior to this year we said there's be a next gen cloud mm -hmm. looks we, we've done five super cloud events in in palo alto all the top industry leaders coming in all kind of agreeing with the, the notion that this idea of not multi-cloud but multiple environments or have to run as one operating system. That's our my word, not their words. But in general, the general consensus on the industry is, yes, we need to have some control plane and data plane, control plane layers that allow us to operate high velocity data traversal. We need more compute. We need more horsepower. And then in comes the big language model push with inference and training. So as we were saying in the cube for months and months now, that inference is the killer app. That is becoming the thing. And I think that's going to be where the developers will have the most opportunity. Um, so, you know, so, being a data developer, as we said, this is now the new thing. What data sets does your code have? So just staying on this architecture for just a minute, I'm going to run this by. See, the idea of separating compute from storage, Snowflake popularized that. The next wave is going to be separating compute from the data, meaning any compute can get to any data. And so that's why you see, for instance, compute AI, one of the super clouds, you know, Vikram Joshi came, Joshi came on. Um, and, and that's what they're doing. You know, it's a startup, but, but basically they're saying, wasn't the stat, who was the stats that compute should be free? Who gave, who that gave was, us that? That, that was, um, that was Joel. Inman, Joel Inman said that. Joel Inman, no, Vikram said, Vikram said that. Did he say that? Vikram said so that. that was kind of four. Right. So basically democratizing compute. Uh, and so, but you think about it, all this data, you know, bring, truly bringing the compute to the data without having to move all the data is going to require, you know, new thinking on, on architectures. We're, we're flipping it. You described it, I think, very well. I mean, the compute, the compute is, compute is oxygen was a great line because it highlights the necessity, right? So, it's like, remember the old um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs slides and when they added a new layer called Wi-Fi uh, yeah, when Wi-Fi yeah, yeah. was hot. It's like, we need more connectivity. <laughs> can't get enough Wi-Fi. Um, this generation of, of users says, I can't get enough horsepower. Uh, I can't get enough data, right? So, you know, the engine room in these organizations and for developers will be, what data do I have? How much data do I have? Do I have the right data? Can I process it fast enough? And can I move it around and or co-locate it in the areas I need it to be available at all times? High availability and highly available systems will be the number one optimized piece. That's why the Broadcoms of the world, Intel's, AMD, and the custom silicon players are talking about this system architecture because what's around the chips will determine how that's going to run. Because what you put at the edge of a telco tower for service is going to be a lot different than the device you put, say, in a, in a rack with a bunch of GPUs. So, but they all got to work together because the user is the consumer. They could be walking around with their phone. They could have their wearable on. Could be stuff coming down from space. 
The future is how fast can you move these packets around? Where's the compute? And compute should be like oxygen in the sense that it should be a utility. So so I get the idea, but it's 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 never going to be free. It might no. be priced low. No, but that, be- that, that's freaked out a lot of people at SuperCloud. They were like, well, 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 hold on. <laughs> yeah, and ubiquitous is a better term because ubiquitous at a very low cost. If the value shifts, you can price in the compute. Right. So if you have good value shifting happening with the market, you, you can just shift the compute to be freer. Now, I think what's more compelling is the CPU, GPU, NPU architecture and then the interconnects around it. That's what got my attention at reInvent. When Jensen was on stage and he showed the demo uh, and and discussed the idea of clustering all those Grace Hoppers together. OK, that was huge. That was a huge moment because what he's basically saying is that Amazon is going to have a supercomputer at will. Just stand up a supercomputer at will. Exaflops. So you know, many, many exaflops. And by the way, and so there was there was a lot of conversation prior to reinvent about how I'll just say it my words. I, 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 I'll, I'll paraphrase that that Nvidia was punishing AWS on allocation because uh because it wouldn't lean into DGX Cloud and and. You know, they pay public. Dave Brown actually last June, I think, publicly said we'd prefer to buy in, you know, component parts. And so you remember we asked, I won't say who it was, but we asked a really qualified, knowledgeable source inside AWS who said, that's BS. Okay. We don't have, we have, we, we don't have, an, you know, we're not getting punished. It's not, there's not an, like kind of some kind of punishing allocation for us. Now, part of that could have been, that they agreed, okay, hey, we're going to actually do the DGX cloud in the quid pro quo could have been, we're going to get access to, to more GPUs. I don't know. Uh, but I think given Amazon's size and and volume, that that's probably, our source is probably, you know, telling us the truth. And it was a very credible yeah. source. It was an engineering well, yeah. source, not, you know, there's, there's some many, marketing there's, source. There's many sources there. And I, I would believe that source to be accurate, but I think it, I have a different perspective on top of that. Clearly, from a competitive standpoint, Core Weave and um, um, the Lambda, another company, they're successful by providing GPU clouds, right? So, um, you know, as we as we look at cloud at GPU cloud as a service, we saw that at supercomputing, the HPC market is not your cloud market. They're completely different animals, but they operate under the same principles. The the get large scale computing, and and they're now targeting. The AI wave has been a gift for the supercomputing and HPC community because all the years have been grinding it out inch by inch, you know, get that extra, extra flop out of it. They're now in pole position because now they can start purpose building clouds, right? So that's going to be a huge renaissance for on-premises activity. Now, I I don't think there's a repatriation issue here. I think it's more of the net new... um, market is going to be net new revenue for sorry yeah it's the, not repatriation it's it's incremental to the existing i mean hpe with its supercomputer chops you know has bought cray you know uh, you know dell you were at supercompute uh, dell dell had a presence yeah but they, uh, it's, my point is my point is it's yeah this is going to see more expansion again rising tide you mentioned it before the more chips more there's gonna be more it's gonna be a renaissance in hardware hardware's back we called it years ago Okay, we were right on that, and that's why you know <laughs> Jeff Clark probably. Yeah, I said it on the cube first. <laughs> well, Damn I mean, the whole the whole <laughs> hardware matters little you know, programming that we did was was beautiful, and it's yeah. uh, it's clearly turning out to be hard, hardware yeah. matters more now that now more than ever. Yeah, because but we were covering Annapurna back then. We were covering Graviton first gen. When you start, we saw that coming clearly. But here's what's the nuance point: the on-premise growth of the more some people call it private clouds back. It doesn't matter what you call it. It's still cloud operations. And here's the nuance. If you're going to run these GPU clusters and or purpose-built supercomputing or HPA, HPC scale systems, they're going to have to be run with cloud operations in mind, meaning the Red Hats are going to win. That's why IBM stoked with the Red Hat acquisition. You see Amazon building cloud-favoring technology so that their cloud wins in a distributed computing architecture because cloud on-premise and edge Cloud core edge, as they call it, on-premise edge. That's the new architecture. That is why the clouds are fighting right now like crazy to be the LLM layer because they want that all computing on their cloud. Well, you saw Jassy on TV the other day. He was, I thought, pretty optimistic. I, I, By the way, I agree with him. I like Amazon's hand. I like Microsoft's hand. You know, Charles Fitz is, Charles Fitz is like, 
always makes it an either or. I mean, Microsoft's got a great business model. Well, he's a Fitz. He's a softy. He anti Amazon. I, I know, I know. But I guess my point is, if you want to compare any company with with Microsoft, okay. I mean, Microsoft's just got a phenomenal business model. I still it, remember. I still remember talking to Bill Ty in Palo Alto when Microsoft was yeah. twenty six dollars a share. Dave, they were in well, the doldrums. I, I, I guess that. I, I, they weren't right. a world class organization then. They've always been world class, but the point is, look but at no, I mean, I mean, I hear you, but I guess they've got, they've really got a good business model, no doubt. Yeah, yeah. But you know, Am I like Amazon's, you know, uh, 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 runway. He said he gave a stat, which I do agree with, actually, and maybe I misunderstood before. He said ten, you know, only ten percent of IT spend is in the cloud, uh, you know, meaning his type of cloud, not not on prem cloud, but but, and I always felt like I, I, I always sort of challenged. I thought they had earlier stated that you know 10 percent of 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 i uh, of infrastructure spend but i think that I, I, he's saying it spend and so maybe i just misunderstood that's legit there's probably only 10 percent of it spend in the cloud but most of that spend is services and software um you know if the market's whatever four trillion probably two trillion is you know services and local services and local vars and gsis and 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 then layer software on top of that, the infrastructure runway is still big, but it's not as big. And so yeah. Amazon, you know, it's going to be interesting to see, you know, how they reinvent. I think you know they're going to be challenged with the day zero. And there's no one of the things Fitzy said is that you know they're they're on the wrong side of no compression algorithm for experience. Yeah, I I I, I don't know if that's true. You know, it's it's funny. I go back and forth. Will open AI be be able to have a competitive moat and and sustainable advantage first mover advantage or will others catch up open ai's tools are good i mean we know from our own usage open ai tools are better than what we're getting out of llama 2 and and other you know platforms you know we'll see i really want to see what bedrock does for us i was talking to our engineering team the other day they said yeah we can we could do that bedrock here's what's going to cost i'm like yeah let's yeah. play around with it and see yeah, I mean, I think ONA will have an advantage. They're the first mover, Dave. It's theirs to lose, right? So, like Netscape before them in the browser wars. Yeah, but like they fumbled they that. Netscape, look what happened oh, to Netscape, oh, right? I what, mean, that's what I was comparing the Sam Altman uh, art um, blunder two weeks ago to the, the Netscape moment. In fact, it's still not over with Sam Altman. Um, Natasha uh, uh, TQ has an article in Washington Post. Them senior leaders say that Sam Altman has been psychologically abusive, were major factors in the board's decision to fire him. So, um, you see that article in the journal about, um, um, we kind of get my rant. I won't, I won't go there now, but you yeah. know, Sam Altman was the big winner in all this. Everybody said Microsoft was a big winner. Microsoft, you know, I guess they, I guess they won in a shootout in overtime. I mean, the Microsoft was not a big winner. I don't. Here. They didn't. They didn't. There's no shootout. They lost. Yeah, I, Microsoft. I, 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 Microsoft. I, I, I diving catch on the end zone to, right. to, and, to and, push and into overtime. They're, they're worse shaped now than they were the Thursday after Ignite, where they had all this momentum. I agree. Sam Altman is the big winner, and Ilya was the loser. I mean, he, you know, they made a bad move. Ilya and the, the 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 previous board were the big losers, but Sam Altman now is you know, in the process of consolidating power. The problem is, okay, so Microsoft gets an observer seat, a board observer seat, so they won't be be be, be surprised and side swiped again. I, I just think the whole structure of open AI has to change. You cannot have, and this is not my rant, but I'll rant anyway. You cannot have a nonprofit running a for-profit. <laughs> That's a tech company. That's stupid. It's just, it's just no way. They're just misaligned. You, you can have a a for-profit running, controlling a non-profit, but you can't have the reverse. The, and that's that's exactly what happened. You had well, let's get into let's get into the rant. Then. I'll get into my rant. You had you saw the the journal article Helen Toner, yeah, who was a, you know, she's an academic and she was on OpenAI's board. And you know what? I have no doubt she's a a, a person trying to do the right thing, but but the the, the fundamental problem is the structure because basically what she was saying is, hey, our mission is to to do AI safely, and hey, you know, hey, what, I, I reported this already before the but, journal, two weeks before the journal. I, I know Helen, you did. It was Helen no. Toner who got him ousted because they clashed over the paper that he she wrote about Anthropic being yes. better. Yes, yes, and you did talk about that, and I think you wrote about it as well. But so, of course, okay, but but so, but your what's your point? But uh, my my point is that 
You cannot have a nonprofit <laughs> running a for profit. It's a, it's a, it is ridiculous. We should do that. I mean, there's so many things going on with these structures. I see these other companies like we should just copy what's working. I guess we can make the cube into this nonprofit and like funnel money this way and have all types of shell corporations and fake companies and fake momentum. Oh my God! But how do they unwind like, this, John? I mean, are there, no, there, there's, there's probably tax implications of trying yeah. to, okay. to to restructure this and and we, of course we, you saw Vinod. Vinod came out basically ripping Helen Toner uh, and and the board because Vinod <laughs> has has a lot in. They probably has tens. Here's of gonna, here's of gonna, dollars. Here's what's going to happen. Here's what's going to happen. One of two things going to happen. Of course, I'll predict this and it'll, it'll be right. So it's either going to die from being ripped apart internally by all this fiefdom fighting because of the structure. Because you're right, the structure is flawed. Okay, or there's so much money and leadership here that people are going to have a half a brain. And I tell you, Satya Nadella being in the working that weekend. Does, does give him prospects. He had to save his investment. It was going to his optionality. Uh, his call on OpenAI was a ten billion dollar call. Okay, that was going to go to zero. So his whole quote. He said he's such a great executive. He had to work. Otherwise, going to go to zero. So with guys like Nutella who who are smart, guys like Jassy. I mean, the Jassy interview on, on CNBC just to make the point was so obvious that he's in full command. He's a great CEO. He knows he's getting the, he can get in the weeds. And there's no question that the press can throw him that he can't have a good answer for. He's got his handle on the business. He's got lieutenants in charge. Nutella is the same way. He ran infrastructure, knows the tech. He could be he can be high level and jump into the weeds. He can be like a helicopter. Those two yeah. guys need to be around the table because they're smart. And so with OpenAI, the, there's two scenarios. OpenAI will get ripped apart because of the greed and the fighters and the egos, or they're going to figure out how to get this billions of dollars of value out of that structure quickly. And as you and I talk about the venture capital world out here, the difference between the East Coast and the West Coast is the West Coast, it's easy to get in, and then they change the back end when things are working, and the East Coast, they negotiate everything up front. Yep. Here in the Valley, it's well documented that you can take a, something that's working and just cut deals. So I think what's going to happen is OpenAI will survive. Given the observability seat for Microsoft, that's going to be the, we're going to make sure that the, the kids don't blow this, right? But and behind the scenes, the money people will make things happen. They'll figure out a structure. They'll make it work because they and, have to, because it's, 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 they get $90 billion valuation on the exactly. table. Exactly. Like, I mean, on. John, the, the idea that a nonprofit can somehow control a ninety billion dollar value company with guys like Satya Nadella, Microsoft, Vinod Kozla, et cetera, in, yeah. in you know, with with that much money, tens and tens of billions at stake. The idea that you know a a, a nonprofit, you know, and a, a think tank board can actually control that is absurd. Yeah, and Dave, and to make it even more, more worse, what what happened was was a child play. You basically had Tony wrote a, an article from an academic standpoint. She thought it was fine. Sam had gotten into a pissing contest with her up over it, and they just had like back and forth. And it's like they just, I can't. It's like I can't Hollywood. I can't work with her. Right? It's like the creative clash, creative culture clash. The fact that that even happened is childish. That the ninety billion dollar valuation and the fact that it all went down that way is a red flag, and that's why the FTC is looking at it. Because and I'd be like, wait a minute, is this even fair? Is there self dealing going on? Is Microsoft's option call? What are the, what's that call about? Are they colluding with the competition? I mean, I don't think there's going to be any of that's going to found out. But what Altman did in that child childish play that went down with all that at stake, you got to have zero confidence in the operations. And then it, well, just it was just reported today that people that were so-called signed that letter were co coerced into it. They didn't even want to go work for Microsoft. So it was completely a, a clown car and like children playing in kindergarten when it should have been adults in the room. So, you know, that that to me is really the red flag. And that was what everyone was talking about through that whole week. Board, board governance, board structure. Here's how boards work. Boards are supposed to protect the, that from happening. Where the I, I, I didn't playing see, with dynamite blow up. I didn't village. see Fitzy commenting on this much. Maybe I just missed it. But uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> so that he to was, me is a really bad busy, look. He's too busy celebrating the Super Clouds two year anniversary. I I shared with you. Or maybe I didn't. I can't remember. It was, it was after the, after the cube. But ETR and we ETR did a flash survey basically. Like in real time, Eric Bradley just mobilized the troops. 
And I talked to a bunch of, of Microsoft and OpenAI customers. They surveyed like 10 or 15 of them. Like a, a very large number were shutting off co-pilots. Now, maybe that was a knee-jerk reaction, but I would I would be shutting I, off co-pilots. I told, I told in, you, in I ran a, kind of... a straw poll on that. When, uh, I actually ran a straw poll with Microsoft customers, and, and it was unanimous. No one kept it on. Most everyone in security companies that have Microsoft turn off Copilot. Okay. And so all this hubbub about Q, the demo being leaking, Copilot's in production. So again, we're going to have problems with, with AI that people have to just get over. That's going to be like bumps in the road, but that's not catastrophic. Uh, and that's my whole point about the Andy Grove quote we always say let chaos reign and reign in the chaos. It, Andy Grove's favorite quote. So we love that on the cube. And anyway, by the they, way, by the way, I thought Azure OpenAI was was generally available. Didn't you? It's it's not. I've been digging around. It, it's uh, just as an aside. Uh, it says I found something. It says here access is currently limited as we navigate high demand, upcoming product improvements, and Microsoft's commitment to responsible AI. For now, we're working with customers with an existing partnership with Microsoft, lower risk use cases, and those committed to incorporating mitigations. More specific information is included in the application form. So this is an article on how do I get access to Azure OpenAI? I, I thought it was, this is on their website, actually. This is on Microsoft's website. How do I get access to Azure OpenAI? I thought it was, was general availability. It's not. So... Well, again, they have a lot of their and their apps are first in in on that. Well, my rant, Dave, is going to be let's hear um, it. Okay, so my rant is on the whole um, Ivy League schools in front of Congress around the whole um, call for um, genocide of the Jews in 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 uh, in Israel, and and what my rant is about is not so much that they're there; it's just it's the it's the it's the encapsulating of the hypocrisy of the woke culture, right? Here you have them standing behind all their language around how they kind of like got there and how bad these institutions are, okay, in terms of how they're run. Harvard, Penn in particular, were like embarrassing. And and they were just on like like total PR scripts when the, the basic concept was if people were having rallies and they're trying to say spe free speech. On um, campuses is allowed when it's saying like kill all the Jews, genocide, promote genocide. They're like that doesn't violate our code of conduct. Like what the fuck? That was like oh my god. And then just watching them, um, just embarrass themselves with their talking points. And my point is, my rant is this: we got to get over talking points and get into real conversations that are just kind of a. We got to get into this, you know, no fault zone of being honest and having intellectual. Um, honesty around what's happening and that's a unique situation but you know technically it's free speech but it's they got the whole me too culture thing going on they got it's this, not free speech it, it's, it's not it's free a, speech it's, a, it's, it's hate it's, speech hate it's, speech is not free speech john I, I, I mean, i'm it, sure you agree hate speech is not free speech hate speech is not free speech and it's ridiculous but watching them justify it you no know, and they like they had answers and they were like prepped like and they and because they know it's kind of a gotcha question but they just won't be honest. And then what they do is they realize, holy shit, everyone's pulling their donations. I just saw Sam Lesson saying, I'm going to go run for a board. He went to Harvard. People are saying, I'm stopping my donations. Um, I'm so happy because let the let everyone see how, how stupid it is. And this is why I think we're in this cultural failed leadership in academic, academia, and government, frankly. So I think, again, I've been saying this counterculture movement's coming, and then you're starting to see a little bit of it. I think the AI wave is going to we'll have it. I think the counterculture, John Markoff wrote a book, book about this, about how um, you know the counterculture sp really spur sp spurred the growth of the computer industry back in the 60s. Okay, access to computers and Stanford's well documented. Um, what the Dormouse said is the name of the book. It's a must read if you're if you're not in understand that generation. And it really was that counterculture was the rebels. And so I think you're going to see our kids, Dave, who are under the age of thirty or under the age of twenty five, and and born Gen Z, saying, "I didn't I didn't bargain for this. This makes no sense." Not that it's a Republican stance; it's just a common sense stance. So that was an embarrassing moment that. For me, it was a flashpoint of, okay, we've reached the culture point of of uh, 
this whatever you want to call it hypocrisy woke cult what i don't even know there's a word for it but it was just so obvious that they they're so tangled in their narratives were you but, were you taught the modern history of israel in 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 high school yes i went to catholic school we learned all our religions yeah but just specifically the not religion the, but the, the 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 formation of israel as a country yes yeah so i wasn't so anything i learned you know it's just from my own reading my kids were certainly taught that and i guess the point i'm, I'm making is that you know we certainly have empathy and you know it's it's painful to to see innocent palestinians you know get get killed or disrupted you know disrupted is an understatement you know but i go back to what you were saying before it's that doesn't mean that you can turn hate speech into free speech and i think you know what the idf is doing they're obviously you know being you know influenced by you know global uh, uh international sentiment uh but at the same time you know i i i can't blame them for wanting to wipe out hamas i know how i felt after 9 11 and this is their 9 11 so again i think people are conflating hate speech with free speech you can't yell fire in a in a crowded theater that's not free speech and hate speech you know similarly you you you, you can't hide under the cloak of free speech when you're out pushing hate speech period Exactly. And, and 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 that takes away from the real conversation is you can have the Palestinians and the Israeli two state conversation. Right. So, uh, again, I'm not a big political person. So, like, I sometimes will step on myself when I try to get into these wade into these ar arguments. But to me, it's just the culture of like just the, the, the word salad of all these narratives around how they justify it. Hate speech being justified. Just terrible, Dave. So that's my rant. Um, What's yours? <laughs> I, I think. Well, my my rant was what I what I shared with you. The, the AI board. It's got to. It's got to. It's got to change. I mean, and, and I don't know what the tax implications are, but you can't have a nonprofit running a ninety billion dollar for profit. It's absurd. The for profit is always going to win, and so because you have too much money, too much power, and you cannot have academics and 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 folks on a nonprofit board who want to do the right thing. I'm sure Helen Toner thought, hey, I'm doing the right thing. I'm doing what the charter of the nonprofit was designed to do. By the way, in, she wasn't wrong in her, in her paper. Anthropic was taking safety more seriously, but you know they weren't. They didn't have the ninety billion dollar valuation that Altman yeah, was pushing I mean, it's, it's, because it's, he just had a successful Dev Day. I mean, what he the Dev Day was a huge success. It was so, good. His Dev Day was. Did you, did you see it? Yeah, it was awesome. outstanding. It was, I mean, it was like really, really good. I, I mean, I got I uh, my respect for Sam Altman increased after that now the last thing we need is another another musk you know so i'm i'm hoping that he can you know mature he 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 apologized and i guess i don't know i don't know if he did publicly or not but supposedly he did i just i think that he's such an important figure um i i think he he's got to hopefully take the high road now he look at the he's the big winner he's consolidated his power and you know, obviously the employees are loyal to him uh Ilya lost his board seat you know, made a bad move, you know, it was completely miscalculated and apologized for it publicly. Uh, that was just a bad look, uh, just naive. Uh, Sam Altman, obviously, you know, very, very, you know, smart player. But look, just you're you're running but right now could be arguably the most important company in the world yeah. in some respects. So you got to you got to really take that responsibility seriously. I'm sure he does but in in a new light i mean you have it's like when 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 you become president you know with the exception of trump i guess <laughs> well you really have to think about you know the impact of your behavior and so i hope he he does well dave great 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 to chat with you great to the recover from took me four days a little sick from reinvent a cold going around but like Naveen Rao's tweet points out Naveen was the founder of mosaic ml sold the data bricks in july for billions and billions of dollars um cube alumni worked at intel this idea of a psycho llm psychologist is interesting comment but that points to the new generation that's here new roles are emerging we're going to see a lot more coming at it we're going to have um a lot more end of year predictions on the cube and siliconangle.com and our 2024 cube calendar 
It's looking busier than ever. Um, we're going to have a great, and our research team is building out. Dave, you're doing a great job with that. And Silicon Thank Angle you. continues to grow in traffic. The stories are strong. We just had a great reinvent. Super Cloud 5, we'll probably get another, another it just happened. We're going to probably do 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. A lot going on, a lot of growth, a lot of action in, in our business. And I want to thank everyone for listening. Go to siliconangle.com. That's where all the, the traffic goes to. Cube.net to find the videos you need and find out next where week. we're next. And, next week, uh, uh, we're doing the 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 super studio. Yeah, we've got a big event next week. The Road to Cyber Resilience, another live stage performance. You'll see a lot more of that this year. So I'm psyched for that. Just just overall, just the content flow and the quality, Dave, has just been amazing. So we'll continue to do that for next year. Yeah, I'm stoked and, and about that. Great There's holiday some practitioners, seat. some customers coming in. So that's going to be really good. Another ecosystem okay. event. And yeah. and uh, that's the Dell yeah. holiday season. I hope everyone's having a good, safe holiday. We'll keep uh, the pod rolling through the end, through the end of the year. We're around all month. Take some time off. End of year stretch, Dave. <laughs> it's like the seventh inning stretch. You taking so, time off? I'm going to take some time off. Not going to go no, skiing. I'm not sure. I need new boots this year. Last year I went through my my favorite boots. Finally uh, <laughs> broke, so I got to get the new boots. So once I get the new boots, I'll be out there. Not much snow out right now. Only got about a thirty foot base. I mean thirty that, that, inches. Base. 30, thirty foot. Thirty inches. Change. Thirty inches. That, thirty. That inches. can change fast in Tahoe. Yeah, right. they're well, skiing see. at Wachusett. I can see. I can see from my house. The the lights are on at Wachusett. They're skiing. I'm, I might play golf this weekend too. So we'll see. That's Dave, awesome. Have a great right, thanks, uh, weekend. We'll see you next week. Thanks, guys.